<laughs> I guess we're still waiting for Josh, or? Yeah, I mean, he was just on the table. Okay. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe I'll just uh, correct an error from last time. Uh, I mentioned we had the differential equation for um, a scalar uh, after Fourier transforming um, in the transverse directions. Uh, and I said it was almost a Bessel function, and then I was thinking, no, it should be a 2 of 1, but that's not true. Uh, it's actually, if you do it, it's a modified Bessel function. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, just, I was just mentioning that, but I, I wanted to make sure that I corrected myself. Right? OK. Um, so things were about to get exciting. Uh, we finally had all the tools we needed to actually compute something. Um, so I had motivated um, this element of the key element of the dictionary that uh, operators in the CFT um, can be given as the essentially the boundary value of fields in ADS up to a power of uh, z. Remember, z equals 0 is the boundary um, with some normalization. And um, and then I had just written this up on the board. Um, so this was, um, remember I mentioned two of the original references. One was Maldison, the other was Witten. Um, so this was what was in Witten's paper that really made um, this duality useful, um, which was showing that you could think of the partition function for the CFT that, that you should equate that with some classical source so that now this is the generating functional for uh, correlation functions on the left-hand side. And that should be equal to the partition function in ADS um, with appropriate boundary val uh, the boundary conditions on ADS fixed by the classical sources in the CFT. Okay. Um, so now... This is, uh, yeah. Was, was that still a conjectural at, at, this, at this moment, at, at today? Uh, conjectural or spin? It depends what, I mean, is there a rigorous mathematical proof? No. Okay. Is there an enormous uh, body of evidence? Yes. Uh, is there a sort of hand wavy derivations? Yeah. But um, to do the sort of hand wavy derivations, I would have to do more string theory, and I don't. I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think it's pretty much universally believed to be correct. Um, right. Okay. So, if we're interested in computing uh, correlation functions for the CFT, um, then we want calculations on the right-hand side to be easy, for example. So that means, um, as we had discussed on the first lecture, that um, we want n large so that we don't have to do quantum gravity in ADS. We want to just do classical gravity. And we want uh, the Tuft coupling uh, large um, so that we don't have to deal with all these alpha prime corrections, all these uh, corrections from the fact that strings are big and floppy. Um, so instead, we're just doing classical supergravity. Okay. Um, after my lecture last yesterday, um, there was a comment that this notation is a little confusing. Um, so when I talk about these operators in the CFT, you should think of them as being some composites made out of whatever I'm integrating in the path integral, so this will this might be like a trace of um, x's, for example. Okay, um, so that's how the dependence um, on x is in this equation. Okay, so let's now um, go ahead and compute a two-point function, and we know what we should expect um, because we should get this kind of um, two-point function because it's a CFT. So 
Right. So in lar large n, large lambda, I can just do a saddle point approximation, and then I'm just computing the on-shell action. So I want to find the on-shell action as a function of the boundary value of the field. Okay. So that's the calculation we need to do. Okay. So that is to say, I want to compute something like this. So this operator in the CFT, whatever it is, I want it to be dual to a scalar, just for the simplicity of this calculation. Okay. Um, so I can compute this correlator by taking functional derivatives of the boundary value of the field of the partition function, uh, the CFT partition function, because these are classical sources for the P CFT partition function, but I'm going to use this saddle point approximation. So then this is just on shell. And then at the end, I would set phi naught to 0, right? Okay. So let's just do um, minimally coupled scalar and find find out what the two-point function is for my CFT operator, OK? So that is, in ADS, my action for the scalar will be this action, which we already uh, talked about a bit. Um, and now I'm working uh, in Euclidean, by the way. so just uh, for convenience. So the equation, we had already written this out, um, but z to the d plus 1, partial z, 1 over z, d plus 1, z squared, dz phi, plus z squared, um, box in the Minkowski sense, uh, and that equals m squared phi. So what I want is uh, a solution with a specified boundary behavior. Um, so I want to find a Green's function. Okay. Um, the sort of obvious approach, which is, would have been my uh, first guess, would be I'll do a Fourier transform in coordinates here, and then I'll Fourier transform the source, uh, and then work out the Green's function that way. Um, but others are much uh, more clever, um, and it suggests look at a kernel of this form. Um, you can actually guess this by going back to the embedding space for ADS, um, but for now let's just take it as a uh, onsatz or something to be checked. Um, So the claim is that this object is a Green's function um, for box. So uh, so if you like your homework, is to show that box k okay, delta is delta delta minus d over l squared k delta. So if I have, remember, um, it's not still there. Um, remember that we had delta, delta minus d is m squared l squared. Um, and so that this will solve um, the equation of motion in the bulk. Okay. On the other hand, for small z, um, If 
becomes a delta function with a power of uh, z out front. And so I can use this um, to find uh, solutions in the bulk with prescribed uh, boundary conditions. So I can say, so I can integrate uh, against this kernel. So I have my, this is the boundary value of the field. I integrate it against my Green's function, and then I get the solution with that prescribed boundary condition. Okay. So this object, by the way, in the context of ADS-CFT, um, I mean this Green's function, uh, is called the bulk to boundary propagator. because it's propagating my boundary condition into the bulk. Okay. All right, so then what we want is the on-shell action um, with the, for this field. So now we just plug this back into the action to find our saddle point approximation for the partition function. Um, so we just plug it in there. Before we do that, though, or before uh, working out all the details, what we can do is um, integrate by parts. Okay, so then one term will be the equations of motion, but this satisfies the equations of motion, so I can drop it, and then I'll just have a boundary term. Okay, um, so that is I'll get. Now it's just root g because I've gone to Euclidean. So this is the box, basically. Yeah. Um, and then minus the equations of motion. So this will drop. But then it's a total derivative, so I get a boundary term. <laughs> But I just have the boundary at z equals 0, so I get minus a half. Um, if I plug in with root g here, um, get a l over z, d minus 1. Yeah, I have a total derivative because the root g's uh, cancel there. And so I have the only boundary is at z equals 0. Um, so this is in the limit of z. This should be evaluated with uh, z going to 0. Um, in, in that limit, um, remember we worked out how phi behaves. Uh, for small z. Um, so I can replace for small z because uh, it's just z to the power delta. Okay. So then I just get uh, z going to 0. Yeah. Uh, I guess I've set l equals to 1 again. And then I just have phi phi here. I guess I'm not being consistent about where I put my x's and my z's in the arguments, but um, so now I'll now I'll plug in uh, with my solution here. Steve, sorry. Yeah. I still don't get the equation. How 
I'll look at that second question again. Uh, I think you left. Here? Did you leave a fire? <laughs> In the, in the divergence? Oh, uh, yes. Oh. Yes, I must have. Thank you. <laughs> I was looking at it. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, of course. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. That, that, that works. Right? Because I... That will work. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, because I integrated by parts. Yeah, yeah. So this <laughs> is the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, way is killed. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Okay. I'm writing slowly, so when I got from one line to the next, <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Now, now is okay. No, okay. All right. Um, good. So now let's plug in uh, with this solution. I'll just leave the limit of z going to zero implicit. Uh, because I'm tired of writing it. Um, so now I'll have an uh, integral d dy, and then let's call it w, I guess. Um, and then I'll have phi naught y, phi naught w, and then k uh, delta uh, z uh, x. Uh, y and then k delta z x uh, w. Um, and then, but I'm taking the limit as z goes to zero, so I can use this for one of the k's. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's, just so I stay with my notes, let's use it for this one. Um, so then this becomes z to the d minus delta, uh, delta x minus y. <coughs> so the z to the d cancels here. So then I have d dx dw, I got rid of the, I'll get rid of the y integral. Uh, and then I have z to the minus delta. I have one k left, so I have a k delta um, z x w. And then I have my two sources, but now y is set equal to x. Okay. Now let's plug in with k, um, and I see that the z to the delta here cancels with the z to the minus delta here. And so up to a constant here, I get integral d dx, d dw, phi naught of x, phi naught of w, over x minus w, it should be the two delta. Because I'm taking z to zero, I drop that, right? So. Um, so now, if I take, if I do this, if I take two functional derivatives, then I just pull out uh, and then set phi naught to zero, then I only, I just pull down one cop, one uh, copy of the action um, because all the other uh, derivatives uh, terms will vanish, and then I'll just get one over the separation to the power two delta up to a normalization, um, which is exactly what I should get for a two-point function in the CFT. Okay. Um, at this point, it's worth emphasizing. Okay, so th this is nice because it shows how the dictionary works, but it's worth emphasizing that this is not actually a check of the, the correspondence, this was guaranteed to work because the symmetries match up. And so we've carefully matched up the symmetries. So at this point, it was guaranteed to work. Um, but it's still an important calculation to do because it fixes the normalization constant um, 
in terms of how how much how the O uh, relates to the field phi. Remember, there's that normalization constant in front of the limit. Um, so I need to do this calculation to fix the normalization of the field. Um, but this gives you a, a feel for how the how calculations work, and if you want to do higher point functions, um, then you'll need to have some sort of interaction term and not just a, a free uh, scalar in the bulk. Um, but you start getting. Um, what are called Witten diagrams. Okay. So if I have global ADS, I can um, draw a picture like this. So mostly I've been doing Poincaré ADS, but people also like to think about global ADS. Um, or sometimes people draw the cylinder. So you can think of this as looking at this cylinder from the top down. So then this would be time. And then this circle would be, uh, remember, the boundary of global ADS is a sphere. So this circle is representing that sphere, so the three sphere. Um, and so this is just sort of a top-down picture of ADS, where this is the boundary, and this is the interior. And so I can think of the calculation I just did as being a two-point function like this. Um, so this would be the Witten diagram, if you like. But I can start doing higher point Witten diagrams. Um, so things like this. And then can even have you know, something like this. So now I'm doing a loop integral. So that would be down by uh, 1 over n, for example. Um, and then to do these kinds of diagrams, for example, I'll need to know not just the bulk to boundary propagator, but I'll need to know the bulk to bulk propagator. So that would be a Green's function with a delta function between two interior points instead of a boundary and an interior point. Um, I'm not going to go through calculations like that because I think it's going to take up a lot of time. Um, but And this gives you a sense of how things work. Um, Sorry? Whether this has to be planar above the, uh, that one? Uh, Maybe there's no crossing the lines there. In the Witten diagram. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it has to be planar in the in ADS. Um, I mean, it's true if you start doing loops, then it's suppressed by 1 over n. Uh, yeah. Um, so at this point, I think I want to start getting a little more schematic, um, so you can get sort of more of a feel for how things work in general, um, without giving quite as many details. Um, Yes. Well, if you go to Euclidean, it's not. Uh, but I mean, it's. Right. Um, well, isn't this just a top-down view, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's both occurring at the same time? 
Yeah. Yeah. So you, they don't have to be at the same time. No, there can be. These can be at different. These points can be at different time. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Ah, so let's start filling out some other entries in the dictionary. Um, So what field does the anti de Sitter space always have? Um, so it's a gravitational theory, so I always have the metric, okay, or the graviton. Um, so that's sort of a universal aspect of, of the bulk. And so there should be some sort of universal element of the CFT that that couples to. So it couples to the stress tensor. Okay. So Um, so the dual of a graviton is going to be the stress tensor. Um, one way of motivating that is on the CFT side, recall that um, to define the stress tensor, you take a derivative with respect to the metric. Um, so you'll be taking a derivative with respect to the boundary metric, and this should be giving you t mu nu up to constants. Um, and so that suggests we do this kind of coupling, um, by which I mean uh, this, this term in the, the matching of the partition functions. So you take the boundary perturbation of the metric, and then that should couple um, to the stress tensor in the CFT, where by this, I mean um, the limit of z goes to 0 of z squared h mu nu. Um, so I won't go through the details, um, but refer you to the literature. But if you compute the two-point function of the stress tensor, in ADS5 cross S5 with the, uh, for n equals 4, which is dual to n equals 4, um, then you find, so that's going to be a, just a, a calculation in linearized gravity in ADS. Um, the following result after fixing normalizations. Uh, K is, so I've gone, this is in uh, momentum space. And from this, you can read off the central charge of the CFT, because the two-point fu function of the stress tensor gives you the um, conformal anomaly. Um, and this quantity um, is protected. So that is to say, the anomaly can't change as you change the coupling. Okay? So it has to be the same at weak coupling as at strong coupling. So now I can compare this to what I get in perturbative calculations on the field theory side in n equals 4 even though this calculation with the graviton and ADS is supposed to be at essentially infinite coupling. And indeed, it exactly matches. Okay, so this would be sort of a first check. Uh, so so the, the ADS, you say it has a graviton, that's in ADS. Yeah. And then the, the second line there is the CFT, that's in the CFT theory. Yeah. And then you, you identify the, uh, the, the stress tensor. Yeah. And then you say that uh, in the ADS CFT, Respond to the gravity. gravity yeah. Okay. And, then, and then here you said the CFT on that hand side, right hand side is from that ADS. Yeah. Oh, okay. So. And then ADS, somehow there is 
something about this is this charge, center charge, yeah. found these ideas. Right. I mean, the point is, I can compute this correlator yeah. in, in two different ways now. I can compute it by just doing traditional field theory, and I now can compute it in ADS. But those are supposed to be valid at weak coupling for the CFT and strong coupling for the CFT. So if it was an ordinary quantity, then I wouldn't, they don't have to be the same, right? Because things change as you change the coupling. But this anomaly has to be the same. Uh, it can't change as you change the coupling. So the fact that I get the same answer uh, doing both the calculation in both ways um, is a non-trivial check. Um, but where did you say the weak coupling and strong coupling? Where, where did, did you say it? The fact that I am doing the calculation using classical uh, supergravity, that means that the gravity is weakly coupled. That means I must be doing a strong coupling calculation in the CFT. Because remember, um, N is... Uh, the the ADS radius in Planck units, That's right, yeah. so the fourth power, as I recall, and lambda is ADS in string units right. uh, to the fourth power. So when the fact that I'm doing um, supergravity and not string theory means that lambda must be large, and the fact that I'm doing a classical calculation in the bulk means that n must also be large. So that's the regime in which I can do the gravity calculation and trust the answer for the CFT. So this is, this is a region, because I have large Tufts coupling, uh, I can't do a perturbative field theory calculation. Right. Okay. That's on the right-hand side, though. But what's that to do with the left-hand side? The right-hand side is the n-large or lambda-large, right? Yeah. yeah. How about the left-hand side, CFT? What does that, why, why is that correspond to the weak? So, I could do a separate calculation of this quantity yeah. just doing traditional, traditional field theory. Yeah. And then I don't know how to do perturbation theory, for example, when the coupling is large. large. Right. So I can only do the calculation at small coupling. Yeah. And then the fact that this quantity has to agree between strong and weak coupling. So then, um, so I've now computed the same quantity in two different ways and then it agrees. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're saying the left hand side using CFT is a weak coupling because yeah. you're doing the traditional configuration. The right hand side has to be in the strong coupling. Yeah. Okay. And then you find the same result and then you say that they have to be the same. Yeah. Um. Um, so, let's talk a little bit more. Um, so one of the things I haven't really talked too much about um, was that the specific correspondence that we've been focusing on, which is uh, N equals four uh, super Yang Mills with SUN gauge theory on the left hand side and ADS5 cross S5 on the right hand side with N units of uh, flux through the sphere. Um, um, I haven't talked at all about the S5. Okay, so you might ask, what is this S5 doing? I've only talked about. ADS. Um, so this this had the SO uh, two comma four symmetry, which we identified with the conformal symmetry on the left hand side. So this agrees with the uh, conformal. Okay. Okay. But what about the S five? Um, so I can redo these exactly these sorts of calculations, but now I'll just decompose in terms of spherical harmonics on the S5. Um, but those need to map to operators uh, in the CFT. And this S5 has an SO6 
symmetry, and so I should see some sort of SO6 symmetry on the left-hand side. And I haven't talked at all about that. Um, but there is actually a SO6 uh, global symmetry on the left-hand side, which is related to the fact that it's n equals 4. Um, and there's a SU4 R symmetry. So basically, uh, I have four supercharges, and I can do rotations between them, and then I have the same theory, um, in particular SU4 rotations. Um, and this is equal to SO6. And so my fields uh, on n equals 4 will have be in mul SO6 multiplets, which I can relate to uh, SO6 multiplets in ADS5 cross S5. So in particular, on the left-hand side, I have in n equals 4, um, I have the gauge field. I have some vial spinners, which are in the fundamental representation of SU4. Um, and then I have some scalars, um, x where s here goes from 1 to 6. So they're in the fundamental of SO6. But these are the same uh, group, actually. And all of these live in the adjoint of SUN. So there are no uh, quarks in uh, n equals 4. There are fermions, but they're adjoint fermions. They're not fundamental fermions. So, um, so remember we had that key equation, uh, which I guess I erased, that m squared was delta delta minus d for scalars. Um, and there are similar equations for other uh, kinds of fields, which relate masses um, in ADS to uh, scaling dimensions in the field theory. So for ADS5, they look like the following. So scalars, we already worked out. If you have spin half or three halves, so this would be your fermions um, or um, gravitinos. If you have p forms, which you do for type 2b supergravity, which is why I'm writing it, um, and then for spin 2, that's the graviton then you can work out it's actually the same as the scalar. Um, and you can, and when I say m here, this is a mass um, in the ADS sense. So when you do a spherical harmonic decomposition uh, on the S5, then that'll bring in some Casimir, some LL plus uh, 4. Um, over the ADS radius, the, the, the S5 radius, which is actually the same as the ADS radius. And so that'll add, that, that acts as an extra mass contribution. So when I'm talking about M here, that's what I mean. So even a massless particle, if it has some angular momentum in the S5, then from the ADS perspective, it looks like it has some mass, right? It's kind of like a Kaluza Klein reduction, but it's not quite a Kaluza Klein reduction. Um, that means an anti-symmetric P tensor. Um, these things occur in supergravity. Uh, and so on the uh, right-hand side here, um, it was type 2B supergravity. Um, so one of the components of the dictionary, which I mentioned, is that there's uh, F a five form, so F mu, nu, rho, 
sigma lambda, which is anti-symmetric in all those indices. It's also self-dual, so if you put an epsilon uh, with 10 indices, then it equals itself. Um, and this, it's getting a little far afield, but uh, this is actually the, essentially the field strength for D3 brains. That's what they source, like electrons source electromagnetic radiation. D3 brains source this thing. Um, so is that like a spin one? Look like what's missing there, spin one or something? Oh. Uh, I don't know why. I didn't write that down. I'd have to look it up. I haven't, I don't have it in front of me. Um, but yeah, it's, spin one is also there. Uh, but not p equal, yeah, different things. Oh yeah, you could set p equals one, and that'll work. Yeah, that's right. Um, what they did for the one? For the both of them. Is that right? Uh, Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, P equals zero, you get the skillet. Yeah, you said P equals two, you don't get the Well, because a spin, by spin two, I mean symmetric. For P, by P form, I mean anti symmetric. So there are different representations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a. So this this is like the graviton where it's symmetric, um, but that's yeah that's worth emphasizing. Um, so one of the points that I uh, made was that the dictionary is only going to relate gauge invariant operators um, in the field theory um, to the diffeomorphism invariant objects in gravity. Um, so. You, it's only going to be a relation between the physical observables. Um, so you shouldn't, so instead of A, um, things like, I, I'm going to get uh, like traces of field strength or traces, because these are all in the adjoint representation. I have to do these kinds of traces, right? Um, so for example, and then, so from here you just have to do a bunch of representation theory to work out uh, what uh, supergravity fields, type 2b supergravity fields, so you decompose them into representations under SO2,4 and SO6. Uh, you look at their masses, and then you compare that um, to scaling dimensions, uh, and then the corresponding symmetries on the left-hand side, and then you can fill out the dictionary. Um, but the basic idea is that for single trace operators in the CFT or in the n equals four um, are identified with super single uh, particles in ADS. Um, so for example, half BPS uh, with spin less than or equal to two in, in ADS. Um, so I guess I should probably write it the other way since I'm putting it on the right side. So on the, uh, in the CFT, you'll have trace over the uh, adjoint rep, and then xi, xj. So these are these x's, for example. Okay. Where now I take the symmetric product plus um, descendants. Remember, so this will be the primary operator. But now I can descend by uh, applying P's, derivatives, essentially. Um, if I want bosons, otherwise I have to do super conformal descendants. So there's a bigger algebra when I have supersymmetry and conformal symmetry, so that's the super conformal algebra, um, which let's not get too distracted. Uh, so on the right-hand side, that's ha so-called half BPS uh, with spin less than or equal to. So this means um, that it's things that break half the supersymmetry, uh, excitations that break half the supersymmetry in ADS. Okay. So those will be supergravity particles, for example. Okay. So those are kind of nice objects. Whereas if you break all the supersymmetry, for example, those are going to be more complicated 
excitations. Um, so BPS means breaking? Ah, uh, it, it's uh, three authors. Three authors. <laughs> and uh, I can, to be honest, I can't always sure. remember their, their names. Uh, so to me, it's always just BPS, but I probably should look up. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I can. It's like Bogomi and. That's OK. Uh, <laughs> Basically, uh, when you look at the super algebra, um, when you have an enhanced supersymmetry, not n equals 1, but higher supersymmetry, then you can get qq equals something. And then because q, so the anti-commutator, but then qq um, can be essentially q, q dagger. And so then you can derive a bound that called the BPS bound, so that uh, because on the left-hand side, you can have q on a state norm squared, and then on the right-hand side, you'd have some charge. Um, and so then, because the norm squared of anything has to be positive definite on the left-hand side, then that tells you that this charge um, has to be above some bound. And so, BPS objects will be ones that saturate this kind of bound. Um, so it's basically a unitarity bound. And they have various nice properties. Um, so for example, they'll be protected um, in the same sense of this conformal anomaly. So they can't, uh, so correlation functions of half BPS um, objects can't change as you change the coupling. So then we can use that as, we, to, as a check on the correspondence, because now I can compute it using traditional field theory, and I can compute it um, in ADS. Uh, so that would be a weak and strong coupling, and then I can see that I get the same answer, and then I have confidence that uh, what I'm doing makes sense. Um, so these kinds of single trace particles, so single trace is roughly, we understand, a single particle excitations. Um, and then if I have multi-trace, Where, so it's like trace x um, at x1, so x1, x2, um, at x2, and so on. So they're at different points. Then that should be, um, oh, sorry, it's multi-trace. So it's like this x at x2. So I have two traces, for example and they're at different points, then I roughly understand that as some kind of two-particle or multi-particle excitation in ADS. Um, if they're at the same point, then that could be a bound state in ADS, for example. Yeah, yeah. Like this n equal four is super young me, right? Because it's a super symmetry. N equal four is just they all these state, right? Scalar and uh, they speak, they do have spin one and the scalar particle, and there's a one spin of has spin one half and the three half. Yeah. That's n equal four, right? Yeah. The symmetry. So that question after there, the particle. In the super symmetry, usually the way <laughs> I would think that all the masses of this guy should be the same, isn't it? Uh, yeah, the that's symmetry. right. Yeah. But, uh, so, so that therefore that says that there's really no one-to-one -one direct correspondence of that field to that thing there. Um, they, they, they well, the same. The, that's what I'm trying to say is that the one-to-one -one mapping is not between these guys. Uh, it's it's between the traces. Uh -huh. So it's between these gauge invariant operators in the CFT sense. So like all the different kinds of operators and then their descendants get mapped to uh, fields in ADS and then their descendants. Okay, so it's not a field. It's yeah, it's not, it's not these objects that I integrate over in the path integral um, that directly get mapped. Yeah. Um, so this was sort of the gist of how things work um, near the vacuum. Okay. But 
for instance, in the bulk, I should have a full theory of gravity, so I should be able to have solutions that are far away from the vacuum. I have a dynamical metric. Um, and that's why I've been caref trying to be careful to say asymptotically ADS. So that's only near the boundary do I need it to settle back down to ADS boundary conditions. In the interior, it may not look anything like ADS, because I can have uh, a lot, if you like, I can have a large number of gravitons that become some sort of uh, new geometry. So, uh, um, more generally, solutions in the bulk, uh, by bulk I mean ADS, respecting the boundary conditions, the ADS boundary conditions, should be dual to states in the CFT. Um, but there'll be states that are far away from the vacuum, because th this will now be some solution that's not ADS everywhere. That's the vacuum. Um, so they'll have some energy that scales roughly like n. Um, and yeah, of SUN large n. So global ADS related to that is the, is the vacuum um, in the CFT. And you can actually show that the ADS 5 cross S5 um, is, a, is actually a, a valid background for string theory to all orders in alpha prime. So um, this doesn't receive corrections um, in the Tuft coupling, this identification. Okay. Where when you go to excited states, um, then there could potentially be some uh, corrections. And sort of related to this, um, well, yeah, related to this is one of the key elements of the dictionary. I mean, what I mean by related is it's you could think of it as a subset of this, actually, is that a black hole at, with temperature T is related, is identified with uh, putting the CFT at finite temperature. Um, there's actually an asterisk on this uh, statement because uh, it depends on the temperature. If the temperature is too low, uh, then actually I just get thermal ADS. So I just get ADS, but with all the particle, all the fields in thermal states. So I would just do thermal field theory and ADS, essentially. Um, but if I have the temperature above roughly the ADS scale, then this is called the, there's a first order phase transition. This is called the Hawking page transition. Um, then I get a the then the dominant contribution to the entropy comes from the black hole. So basically, there are several saddle points, and then as you change the temperature, the, it, the if the temperature becomes high enough, then the black hole saddle point wins. Um, it becomes the the leading saddle point. Uh, but if the temperature is too low, then thermal ADS is the leading saddle point. And why I said that this is a subset of this first statement. Um, is because if I have the CFT at some temperature t, then that means if I have Euclidean time, the, I'll have some period beta, 1 by t. Um, so now I've changed the boundary conditions in the CFT, right? Because now the time's periodic, the Euclidean time's periodic. So in ADS, I'll do the same thing. Um, so when I have a black hole and I wick rotate, then you may know that uh, I can get the temperature out by demanding smoothness at the horizon. Um, and then I can exactly match um, the temperatures that way. OK. So what? If we step back a second, um, uh, 
what is the role of z, this coordinate z, uh, for the CFT? Right? The CFT doesn't have z, but somehow when I go to strong coupling, the natural description um, has an extra dimension to it. So what is, what is z doing? Um, and the way we heuristically understand it is that z in the CFT should roughly be understood as the energy scale. Or the size of bound states or something. Um, and this partly becomes about because uh, one of the killing vectors um, in ADS, which had roughly a translation in z and a scaling of x at the same time. So if I take, uh, if I do scale transformations in the CFT, then that corresponds to roughly simultaneous translations in the z direction. Um, so what I get out of this picture is what's sometimes called the UVIR connection, um, which is that in global ADS, or also in point career ADS, but it's easier to draw these pictures in global ADS, I guess. Um, if I imagine cutting off, putting an IR cutoff uh, in ADS by putting limiting the size uh, 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 where the, you know, cutting off away from the boundary. Um, and then I ask, what does that correspond to in the dual field theory? Or equivalently, imagine I integrate out um, this region here near the boundary. So what physics did I integrate out of the CFT? Well, if I start thinking about, for example, geodesics or uh, correlation functions or, well, there's a geodesic approximation for the correlation function, but um, then things that only probe this region will have some length scale uh, delta associated with them. And so delta will roughly get related to epsilon in ADS units. So this IR cutoff in ADS becomes a UV cutoff in the field theory because it, it's a very short distance physics in the CFT that I've integrated out. And so roughly what the language we use is that deep in the interior of ADS, I should think of as the infrared. And out near the boundary, I should think of the UV. Okay. So when I say that near the boundary I want to keep ADS, that's saying I want to keep the same UV fixed point. I want to keep this, at high, at, at high energies and small length scales, I shouldn't change the physics much. Uh, but in the infrared, um, I'm allowed to change things. And that um, matches with this idea of the black hole being at some temperature T, because uh, as I increase the temperature, um, the, in ADS, it turns out the black hole actually increases in size. It's the opposite of flat space. Um, and so roughly, this radial coordinate is some kind of energy scale. Um, so there are lots of other games we can play um, in elements of the dictionary, but OK, good. Um, so to give you sort of a condensed matter type uh, application. Um, one, one type of game you might want to play is turning on some an electric field um, in the boundary, in the CFT, and then find the current that results from that. And then fig from that, you can get the conductivity, right? So it gives you the response. So how do you do that calculation in ADS? So recall, near the boundary, there are two kinds of solutions, because it's a second order differential equation. Um, so it turns out something like this. 
so there are two powers, right? One, one was blowing up and one was going to zero. As that goes to zero, And the basic idea, and this is uh, quite generally true in ADS-CFT, is you kind of want to think of the radial direction, the z direction, um, as being like a time coordinate that you're evolving in. Okay? Or just like in, in RG, you sort of think of the energy scale as being like a coordinate that you evolve in. Um, so if I do a Hamilton-Jacobi type reasoning, um, with z is the evolution, then I conclude that the functional derivative of the action with respect to some boundary condition um, <coughs> how do I want to well, okay, let me if I have just a, a, a single particle uh, mechanics problem then the derivative of the action with respect to the boundary condition is the canonical momentum, where pi, so pi of t is partial x dot. So this is uh, from Hamilton-Jacobi theory. And so the idea is that I'll do the same thing with the generating function, uh, functional um, for field theory, but thinking of z is dynamical, so then I'll do um, sorry, this should be x is what I mean, because that's the expectation value in the CFT. But then this um, This has to be regulated, um, so I take the finite part. But the upshot of this is, is that I can think of um, if I want to like compute the conductivity, then I want the um, response over the source. Is that right? Uh, electric field, yeah. Um, so I want to do phi 1. Remember, I, I mean, this is sort of just arguing that I can think of um, phi 1 here with the positive mode that goes to 0 near the boundary as the response to some source phi naught that I put in by hand. And so I can think of phi uh, 1 over phi naught as some uh, linear response, like the conductivity. And I can do that at fi compute this at finite temperature by putting in a black hole. So I could put a black hole in the interior of ADS. And then I have to put boundary conditions uh, on the horizon of the black hole that stuff only goes in, doesn't come out. Okay. So then that forces a uh, relation, right? Because I have a second order differential equation, and now I impose a boundary condition on the horizon. Um, and so that relates these two coefficients. And then I can find conductivity, for example, as a function of temperature. Um, so then that's one of the calculations that people like to do. But how do they know that is corresponding to that? The, uh, maybe the phi 1 will not correspond to that, the, uh, the current. So I was trying to argue, uh, so at first it was just a conjecture uh, as, as an element of the dictionary. But you can sort of argue from uh, Witten's matching equality for the partition functions using this Hamilton-Jacobi type reasoning, uh, but which I don't think I conveyed 
very well, but... Uh, I see. Oh, you're saying the, can, can, it could have some sort of mathematical expression that... It, yeah. Like a Yeah. Yeah. Why do you So, um, remember that uh, what we had said is the partition function. Um, for the CFT, so if I do um, with a classical source, phi naught, that this was equal to uh, ADS the path integral in ADS, but let's just do the large n, large lambda, so just the on-shell action, um, with boundary conditions such that the this guy was turned on um, as a classical source in the field theory. So then the idea is that if I want the response function, the one point function, then I should do d by d phi 0 of that. Um, and then you can argue uh, that when I have the on-shell action, if I do d by d boundary condition, then that has to be this conjugate variable. And indeed, the conjugate variable, in this sense, um, is going to be phi 1. So the second piece is the conjugate variable of the first piece. Yes. So that's a missing link. OK. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I mean, put another way, if you just turned the crank and computed the on-shell action uh, with this as your field, um, and then took the functional derivative with respect to phi 0, then you would find that it gives you phi 1. Uh, so I mean, you could just brute force it, but there's a general argument that these two things have to be paired together. Um, OK. So if you're doing uh, condensed matter applications, um, you usually you won't be doing this version of the duality. You'll generally be doing, uh, you'll just take some ADS and you'll put some general fields in it as some sort of model, a phenomenological model, if you like, of some strongly coupled. You just argue that it gives you some strongly coupled answer. And then you see how closely it matches with whatever physics you're trying to capture. Um, as an basically an entirely alternate formulation of physics. Uh, in terms of specifically this n equals 4 correspondence, um, some other quantities that come out. Um, is you can compute uh, the entropy per unit volume on both sides. Um, and you find that it has the right scaling. Um, if you compute it in the ADS, you find it has the right scaling uh, with temperature in N um, to be the conformal field theory result. So that's a nice check um, of this correspondence. Um, but if you do the free CFT, or the weakly coupled CFT, it doesn't quite agree. Um, but that's OK. The entropy can change as you change coupling. Um, but these are off by a famous factor of 3 fourths between strong and weak coupling. 
um, which occasionally people raise uh, in the context of applications to QCD. Um, but uh, if you like, this is actually a prediction of ADS CFT that there's not an independent check of this factor of three force. Um, but it was non trivial that you get the right scaling um, out here without any lambdas. Other. Uh, okay, when you say that statement, the three force there, what, what do you mean? Do you say when people are making comment about it related to QCD, what, what is it? Um, so we can compute, in QCD, you can compute the entropy density. I don't, it, it perturbatively, I don't happen to remember the, I mean, it's something like this, but I don't know the prefactor. Um, and then you can compare when QCD is in this strongly coupled conformal window that people talk about. And there it seems to go down by some factor, uh, which is almost three-fourths-ish, uh, I think. But I really don't work in that area, so I, c I can't tell you more. Yeah. So you mean deforming QCD with the number of flavors? Or uh, Usually that's what people do. What? They change it. Yeah, but there are so many hands. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Because that's one way to get into the conformal regime. I would have to check, to be honest. Uh, my impression was that it was a certain kinematic regime, but I, I really uh, I can't say more without uh, looking in some references, what people have in mind there. So we, the upper one is a strong coupling? And yeah. The lower one is a weak coupling? Yeah. That's yes, yes. Um, so an another uh, famous entry in the ADS-CFT correspondence that was uh, that Maldasena wrote up um, almost immediately after his first paper was Wilson loops um, in n equals four, for example, um, should be understood as a fundamental string in ADS. And the reasoning um, is that if you have an open string uh, in, in string theory, the endpoints um, which have to attach to some D brain, in the D brain, they act as uh, fluxes of, uh, uh, sources of flux. Um, basically, they, they behave like the QCD string. So the, the endpoints behave like quarks. Um, and so then, you can understand when you do a, a Wilson loop, then you can sort of think of it as integrating some quark lines. Uh, and so then it, you should understand this as being some world sheet um, in, so this would be Z, um, in ADS. And so if you do the strong coupling large n limit, then you should just be doing a classical string in ADS. So then you just want to compute the on-shell action for a classical string uh, in ADS. And so then that just becomes the area of a minimal uh, surface in ADS. And that's supposed to be the expectation value of the Wilson loop, corresponding Wilson loop with the boundary conditions. Um, when you do this calculation, you actually find the area is divergent. Um, and so you have to renormalize. So you have to subtract off. Uh, it's divergent because when you approach the boundary, um, there's an infinite distance there. Um, so then you have to subtract off, if I remember correctly how the calculation goes, you subtract off basically a free uh, you, you subtract off a divergent piece from just the fact that the string is, is there um, extending away from the boundary. Um, and then you can match that uh, 
qualitatively with what you expect to get uh, in a conformal field theory for this Wilson loop. Um, so then, if you want to use the expectation value of a Wilson loop as a, a, a indication of whether or not you're in a confining phase, um, then you can understand what you need to do in the bulk uh, so that this Wilson loop behaves uh, like there's confinement. And so then you can try and put in some D brains uh, into the bulk of ADS and try and get that kind of qualitative features. Um, so that's the kind of game that people like to play. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So what does this map before you close it into a loop? Could you give us some perspective what um, the simpler case maps on to an idea? Well, if you're in Poincaré uh, ADS, then I, I suppose that would correspond to just um, a string that just hangs on and goes goes on forever because Poincaré ADS keeps going for z. Uh, if you have a q q bar pair, a meson, then it's just a string hanging down into ADS. So it's like finding geodesic. Uh, yeah. That yes. Yeah. Because there's some tension, so it wants to. Um, and you, yeah, from string theory, we know that this behaves like a Q, Q, Q and Q bar. And then the, the idea is that the fact that there's a string connecting them should mean that they're in some bound state. So this should be like a meson. That's the. So when you're making a spatial loop, you're basically promoting string to a surface. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. Thank you. So there's been a couple more recent uh, sort of entries in the dictionary. Um, that have become uh, very interesting developments and, and useful for proving things. Um, One is due to these two authors, Ryu and Takinagi. Um, which is, they're in, they were interested in how to compute um, entanglement entropy. Um, so it, we could do a whole lecture on entanglement entropy. But uh, entanglement entropy um, you know, is an interesting thing you can compute in field theory. Um, and it's especially of interest, or a lot of initial interest came out of condensed matter. Um, but uh, there's actually a lot of interest in high energy theory right now. Um, partially related to this and partially just uh, related to other ideas. So the question was, how do you compute entanglement entropy? It's some sort of quantity you can compute in the field theory. How do you compute that in ADS? Um, and they gave a conjecture of that, which has now been uh, proven in sub subcases, at least. Um, and the claim is that you take the area of uh, co-dimension two, minimal surface. And ADS d plus 1 gives the entanglement entropy so, um, in the CFT for the region which is um, bounded. Uh, so it's like this picture, but the dimensions are different, because this, uh, this area will be uh, 
this surface will be co-dimension two, whereas here um, it's always the world string world sheet, so it's always two dimensions. So uh, in ADS five, um, this would be some three-dimensional surface. Uh, so the idea is that if I have in the CFT, this is just space, okay, not space and time, space. Um, so in the CFT, it's co-dimension one. Then when I talk about the geometric entanglement entropy, then that's the von Neumann entanglement entropy uh, for this region. So that means, if you don't know what it means, then don't worry about it. Uh, otherwise, I <laughs> would take too long to explain. Um, but to compute that quantity, if you are interested, um, the idea is that you would compute this uh, minimal surface that connects uh, what's, with what's called the entangling surface um, in the CFT. And this has at least been proven in some special cases, um, and more generally uh, seems to be to satisfy all the right criteria. So this has been of a lot of interest because entanglement entropy is actually very difficult to compute. Um, even in free theories, it can be a difficult calculation. So to be able to compute this in strongly coupled theories is exciting. Um, a lot of, so, so far, and historically, the initial excitement um, with the duality was about how to compute things in strongly coupled field theory using ADS. But more recently, people have started thinking harder about the duality and how do you compute quantities in the bulk um, in the ABS in gravity in terms of this conventional C, uh, CFT because that's also very interesting because we're still very confused about aspects of uh, quantum gravity. And you can think of um, you know this element in the dictionary So this tells us how I can understand fields in the bulk at the boundary uh, directly in terms of CFT operators uh, at a point. Um, but then there's a question of if I have a, oper a, a, a field in the interior of ADS, what does that correspond to in the CFT? Um, and these fellows figured that out, um, at least uh, in the regime of validity of their construction, that if you have some point x here, uh, 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 z, um, and you want to know the, what this field at a point uh, z and x is in, in ADS, what the dual of that is in the CFT, then it becomes this same operator smeared um, over some region um, in the CFT. And they work out precisely what these smearing functions are. Um, and you can correct them perturbatively in 1 over n. Um, but more generally, the construction uh, breaks down. So you can't use this, for example, to resolve uh, what happens when at the horizon of a black hole, which has been one thing that people would like to use this correspondence to answer. but. Um, this element of the dictionary actually breaks down precisely when you try and ask that question. Um, so in the remaining minutes here, um, let me just talk about top-down versus bottom-up philosophy. Um, so where did, where did this correspondence come from? Well, it came from studying these objects in string theory called D-brains. Um, so the idea was that just as a cartoon, you had a bunch of D-brains. They have open strings between them. In, 
And this open string description um, gives rise, collect, the, the collective degrees of freedom give you a field theory. Um, and there's a closed string de description of the same objects, um, which give you some black brain solution in supergravity. And these two descriptions are valid at weak uh, string coupling and in strong string coupling. And then if you take a low energy limit, or RG flow, the IR fixed point is some CFT. For the case of D3 brains, it's this n equals 4 CFT. And the analog of this RG flow here is a low energy limit, um, sometimes called the decoupling limit. Decoupling limit. Uh, where you zoom in on the horizon of these, this extremal black brain solution. Um, and that gives you an ADS, or in the case of D3 brains, ADS 5 cross S5. And the claim is that these are two fixed points of some kind of RG flow, um, and that these should be um, dual to each other. So you can play, and that's how we get, we know precisely what this CFT is. Um, and we know exactly like what's going on in this ADS. It's this 2B supergravity with so many units of flux and so on because it came from this uh, stringy construction. But there are other examples where we can play the game, not just the D3 brains. In fact, sort of the first example was not uh, with these D3 brains. That's mostly of interest because people get excited by this four-dimensional uh, SUN gauge theory that at least has some qualitative similarities with QCD. Um, but there is an older one, or a slightly older one, um, which is actually what my dissertation was on, which is the D1D5 bound state. Um, so these are just some other objects. Don't, don't worry about it too much. Uh, let's forget about that. Um, and instead of giving you ADS5 cross S5, it gives you ADS3 cross S3, cross um, a four torus or something called K3. Okay. Um, and so the dual description is a two-dimensional CFT. Okay. Um, and so that's actually where I, what I understand best, um, but is probably not of the most general interest. It's a very funny uh, CFT, actually. You can do, if you start with M3, you can do M2 brains. Um, and then you get an ADS4 cross S7. And then uh, you have M5 brains in M theory. Um, and that gives you ADS7 cross S4. And again, we understand uh, the field theories more or less fairly well. Um, I mean, we fairly precisely know what they are. Um, and it turns out that this correspondence uh, turns out to be incredibly robust. So that is, you can do all sorts of deformations um, on both sides and then see that things continue to agree. Um, so in Polchensky's lecture, he said that you can bang on it um, and then it still works. Um, and that's why it's been uh, so useful. Um, in yeah. Here, this for the observation, when you said about regarding the field theory, is that field theory is our usual field theory? Uh, and what what do you mean by usual field theory? Usual field theory, like this like this CFT, right? We talk about the uh, well, that at this at this point, when I write field theory, it's not going to be a conformal field theory. Yeah. Um, it'll be some non-renormalizable uh, field theory. Yeah. But it's an ordinary. It's ordinary field theory. Field theory. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's not something you'll find in Peskin and Schroeder, uh, but it, it's something you could study using conventional field theory techniques. Uh, it has local interactions. Yes, well, yeah. Um, I mean, one, yeah, I mean, like, one thing is, like, called the DBI action, um, which uh, 
a theory of like a membrane, basically. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a local field theory. Um, so you, the ways in which, um, to quote Polchinski, you can bang on it. Um, what does it mean, bang on So it means you can, yeah. So you can deform the boundary conditions and then on you know, on ADS and then uh, in the CFT, and then you find that things continue to agree. In fact, I have some, apparently I have some boundary conditions named after me and my co-authors oh. uh, <laughs> for ADS three. I recently discovered. Um, you can also try and deform the compact space, um, so that would be like the S five. Um, so that would correspond to breaking that R symmetry in some way um, for the uh, n equals 4. You can play games where you RG flow um, to a second ADS um, and then explore things like the C theorem. Um, so you'll have an, AD, an ADS for small z and then Eventually, and then in the intermediate values of z, uh, you'll have some other kind of space time. And then for a very large z, it looks like ADS again. Um, you can relax uh, this decoupling limit so that now you talk about um, scattering problems. Uh, in asymptotic flat space. Um, so that's something I've done a bit on. Um, you can put other objects in string theory in the ADS and then ask what does that correspond to in the CFT. So you can put in brains. In this n equals 4 example, you, uh, you can relate that to baryons, for example. Um, and there are many other kinds of games you can play. Um, can I just have uh, like five more minutes? Sure. OK. Yeah. So that, that's sort of, this is the this top down. Start from string theory, figure out exactly what CFT you have, figure out what the ADS theory is, and then you know they're dual. And you, you have some confidence in it. Yeah. And then you can try and deform it in various ways and try and get closer to the physics you're after. Steve, mm -hmm. is there any role of the supersymmetry here? i kind of about to exp I mean, when you have these black brains, they're extremal. Um, in fact, they're BPS, to use that three letters again. Uh, it's the biophysical American. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 yeah, it was kind of funny when I realized that. But uh, so there'll be s these these solutions in string theory are all going to be supersymmetric. Uh, they'll break some number of the supersymmetry, uh, but leave, um, but but leave some of the preserve um, most of the supersymmetry. So that's why the supersymmetry arises is because w you take this, these brains in the extremal limit where they're saturating this B BPS bound. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the bottom up kind of philosophy and then I'll tell you sort of the role that supersymmetry is playing uh, just in a second. Um, actually, before I do that, I should mention there's not just these uh, stringy dualities. Um, more recently, um, there's higher spin theory uh, dualities. And these are uh, very interesting. Um, so Vesalyev, for years and years and years, had been working on these higher spin theories. So these, they have an infinite number of spins going from, so they have a graviton, but then they have spin three, spin four, spin five, spin six to infinity, and they have some complicated interactions and an enormous gauge symmetry, much, much bigger than diffeomorphisms. Um, 
so he was working on these essentially by himself, and no one, everyone sort of ignored him. Uh, and then people realized that that higher spin theory naturally lived in ADS, and that it had a CFT dual. Uh, and now it's uh, very celebrated, and lots of people are studying this. Um, it's these dualities are related. Or this higher spin theory, I should say, is kind of related. You can think of it as uh, taking string theory with alpha prime going to infinity. So remember, alpha prime was 1 over the tension. So it's tensionless limit of the string. So then every the string is just can become arbitrarily floppy. And so that's why I have all these uh, spin degrees of freedom. Um, it's not, the Vesalio theory is not quite this limit of string theory because it actually has a single Reggie trajectory, unlike string theory. Um, so the it's more like a, a floppy, rigid dipole. Uh, if you tried to do like a second quantization of that, um, then you'd get something like Vesalius theory. Um, the dual uh, CFTs are actually very nice objects. They tend to be vector models um, instead of adjoint um, with the large n. And again, uh, you can understand Newton's constant being 1 by n. Um, and what's kind of striking about these dualities is that examples include um, free field theories. So you can start asking, you know, what's the dual of a free field theory? Well, it's, uh, at least with these vector models, it's one of these higher spin theories, which is consistent with what I've been saying about the role of the tuft cup, right? Because that's related to the string tension. So, uh, okay. So what's this bottom-up philosophy that I'm talking about? So basically, that you can convince yourself that. Um, this correspondence is so robust uh, that we actually don't really see how it can fail. Uh, so in a way that all the properties always seem to match <coughs> qualitatively. And like, for instance, one of the, one of the tests you can start doing um, is looking at causality in ADS. Um, because the causal structure of ADS doesn't have, doesn't naively at least have to agree with the causal structure of the field theory. So you can start putting in sources in the field theory and asking, you know, they'll collide in the interior. Um, and does that, does that all work out in the CFT? It's highly not obvious that it will. Um, but it does. Um, so the philosophy is that basically any um, CFT should define some kind of gravitational dual, maybe. So let's conjecture that. So some gravitational theory in ADS. And what uh, what are the ingredients that we need for this field theory to have um, in order for this gravitational theory to be nice uh, or to have a limit uh, where it becomes classical and doesn't have all these higher spin degrees of freedom or lots of derivative corrections. Um, so in the bulk, we don't want to have an enormous number of massless fields. That's what happens when you have uh, the tensionless limit. You have an, you have an infinite because there's no tension, then I can make the string as wiggly as I want. It doesn't cost me any energy. And then each of those gives me a new field, um, massless field. So you only want, let's say, a few massless fields um, in ADS. But remember that the mass. Uh, the masses were related to these conformal dimensions. Okay. So that means that ex with the exception of a small number, all the conformal dimensions need to be large. 
Okay, so that means I need to have large anomalous dimensions for almost all the fields. Um, in the CFT, which means that I need to be at strong coupling. And this is roughly where, uh, as we understand it in the general scheme of things, supersymmetry fits in. Basically, if I don't have something like supersymmetry protecting quantities, then a lot of field theories will become sick when I start taking the coupling to infinity. Um, that's at least what I'm told. Um, so I mean, it, basically, the kinds of problems you get with the Lando pole in QED, um, you, want, you want this strong coupling limit to make sense in some way. And at least as far as the examples we know tend to have supersymmetry. Um, so this was uh, the analog of small alpha prime corrections. Um, but we also want to talk, we want uh, the ADS to be classical. So we need the ADS scale um, to be large in Planck units. Um, and that means that I can form a black hole in ADS, and that has a lot of entropy, um, because the area of that horizon uh, will be large in Planck units. So that means I need the CFT has to have a lot of degrees of freedom. Um, and so that means I need something like large n um, limit. But more generally, if I'm willing to have sort of floppy extended objects or start thinking about quantum gravity, then the idea is that I should allow myself um, to start thinking about sort of general, this duality in a very general sense. Um, and so that's what um, I would call sort of the more modern perspective on idea of CFT, is not focusing quite so much um, on the string theory derivation, but start thinking harder about what is, how does this duality work in general, um, and what can I, how can I start like constraining quantum gravity by doing things like the conformal bootstrap. Um, I think I'll stop there. Right.